Welcome to Bups' Dharma Lounge. I invite you to sit back, relax, as we discuss all things Dharma. Welcome back. I'm Bupsa Frank Jude, and it's been a long three months since the last episode that uh, I posted. And as we enter into this new year, I, I don't make New Year's resolutions, but I am going to try to make a strong aspiration to try to drop at least one episode a month this year, uh, but ideally perhaps uh, one episode every two weeks. So that's the ideal, that's the goal. And as always, most will be short form talks on various aspects of Buddhism and Zen naturalism in particular. Uh, some of them could be as short as 10, 12 minutes, uh, no longer than maybe 20, 25. Um, and then there'll be occasional guided practices, and those usually run a little bit longer, but usually again, around 30 minutes or so. Um, and then the longest ones will be conversations with other teachers and practitioners. So I want to say right now, if you would like to chat here with me, or you have some suggestions for topics, or for other folks that you might like to hear from, please email your suggestions uh, to me via the website, www.mindfulnessyoga.net. Now, at the end of 2023, uh, the podcast platforms that uh, this podcast is on Send me a summary of how the podcast did throughout the year. And uh, we're small, right? But still, uh, I was very happy to see that there's quite a few of you who listed uh, Bups' Dharma Lounge as your favorite podcast. And there are even more of you who listed as your second or third favorite. So while I ask all listeners and watchers for support, if you are among those who list this podcast as among your favorite, whether it's first, second, or third, <laughs> I beseech you to really consider supporting this podcast in any or all of the following ways. First, most importantly, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet, it costs nothing. Just hit that little tag that says subscribe. Uh, second, share with others, anybody that you think might be even remotely interested. If not the podcast as a whole, maybe there's an episode that you think, oh, someone else might be benefit, uh, benefit from this, uh, share it. Um, some of the platforms offer you uh, the opportunity to rate the podcast. So give your five-star ratings, all right? If I'm one of the top three of your favorite podcasts, I, I think that deserves five stars. Um, comment where possible. Here on YouTube especially, there's, you know, it would be really great to see if we can create more conversation. And then finally, please consider offering Donna. And if you're not familiar with the concept of Donna, there's an earlier episode, check it out. Donna literally means sharing. Now, I have purposefully chosen not to monetize this podcast. No ads, no sponsorship, right? And there's no charging any subscription tiers. And I don't even have Patreon where like there are different levels or anything else. Uh, this is not a fee for service. This podcast is my sharing. It's my Donna offering. Sharing with you, right? And in response, um, if there's anything you would like to share with me, right? Now, in the past, uh, in the earliest uh, years of the Buddhist Sangha, um, those who benefited from the Buddhist teachings supplied the Buddha and his Sangha with clothing, medicine, and food. Um, so nowadays, the contemporary Donna offering tends to be money. Um, you want to send other things? I don't know how that would be possible, <laughs> but you might ask. <laughs> but anyway, if you would like to um, offer any Donna uh, through PayPal or Venmo, no matter what the sum, it will be greatly appreciated. Now, some people offer monthly. You know, they just do it whether I drop a, an episode or not. Right. Others, I notice, send uh, a little Donna after each episode. So um, that's up to you. 
Now, since September, right, three months ago, the last episode I dropped, the following have generously offered Donna. And I wish to offer my deepest gratitude and appreciation to Chatra Sandy Greenberg, Jabuna Allison Brown, Jishin Carolyn Hill, Gabion Sally Weber, Hyokin Tatiana Staloff, and Teriok Kate Rapley. Thank you all. So, as I said, um, I'm planning on hopefully getting down at least one episode a month, maybe two. And I am planning this year to start a series that is specifically around mindfulness yoga. Some of you may know that I wrote a book called Mindfulness Yoga, and um, to this date, I mean, that book came out in 2004, so 20 years ago this year, um, as far as I know, there may be other books like Cindy Lee's book that integrate Buddhist teachings with asana, yoga asana practices, but as far as I know, there's still no book like mine which is literally based upon the mindfulness instructions that the Buddha gave in the two most important uh, suttas, uh, Anapanasati, mindfulness of the in and out breath, and Satipatthana, which is sometimes referred to as the um, mindfulness of the four foundations or um, the domains, as I like to say. So um, that book is based upon those teachings. Um, I also be talk uh, probably the first episode on mindfulness yoga will be what it really is and how it differs from mindful yoga. There's a lot of people saying that they teach mindful yoga. Mindfulness yoga is a specific practice and I will discuss that. Um, again, I also plan on doing more conversations. Uh, Barry Rissman and I are going to continue our series of talks based upon her uh, principles from her book, our wonderful book, Evolving Your Yoga, or Evolve Your Yoga. I'm not good with titles, but I really love her book. Um, also, um, there'll be an occasional book or film review. Right? Um, I was involved in filmmaking, and um, film is another one of my passions, and I, I love literature. So, uh, so when I say an occasional book or film review, it may or may not be specifically Buddhist-related, but... Um, for instance, years ago, I did a film series called Cinema Nirvana, Nir ah, Cinema Nirvana and um, in it, uh, I would show films that were not obvious, you know, sometimes TV episodes, like we did some really fun episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, I looked at um, movies like Memento, um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and teased out the Dharma lessons from these books. So I will maybe do some book reviews, uh, film reviews, again, relating it to specific as aspects of Buddha Sasana, Sasana being the teachings of the Buddha. And that will include a series on Buddhist ethics. So I thought for the first episode of this new year, I would start by offering a short book review on this here book, that if you're on YouTube, you're seeing it, but if not, it is a book on Buddhist ethics called Destroying Mara Forever. Right? And it's in honor of Damien Kion, edited by John Powers and Charles S. Prebish. Right. So, it was published in uh, 2009 by Snow Lion Publications. And if you're unfamiliar with the three uh, men that I just named, Damien Kion is the man being honored with this collection of essays. Uh, he's a British academic and bioethicist specializing in Buddhist bioethics. And he's extensively published on Buddhism and varying ethical issues. Uh, for instance, he's written about the ethics of suicide uh, the issue of brain death in relation to organ donation, as well as the ethical relationship between Buddhism and ecology. Now, John Powers, one of the two co-editors, is an American-born professor of Asian studies in Buddhism who spent most of his career in Australia, and he's a practicing Buddhist specializing in Tibetan Buddhism. And Charles Prebish 
is a specialist in Buddhist studies whose research focuses on early Indian Buddhism with an emphasis on the monastic tradition and sectarian movement and on the development of Buddhism in the West. He's a prolific researcher and writer. He's published the, over 20 books, including one that is now considered a classic volume in Buddhist studies, Luminous Passage, The Practice and Study of Buddhism in America. And that came out in 1999. So the first thing I want to say about this book is that I really liked it. It's a really diverse collection of ethics, uh, essays on ethics, but I absolutely hate the title. I think it's stupid, actually. It's a stupid title and just plain wrong, right? Especially for a book on Buddhist ethics. One of the contributors, Peter Harvey, was my teacher in um, my graduate uh, studies program at Sunderland University. And I asked him about that. I said, what's with this title? And he also thought that it was not a good title. He thought it was inappropriate, incorrect. Um, he might not have said stupid, but that's definitely what I think, right? And it's, and, but he said that the editors insisted on this title. And that's kind of strange because, as I've noted, these two editors are among the world's foremost Buddhist scholars. So why do I think it's wrong or stupid title, right? Well, it's because even the Buddha did not destroy Mara upon his awakening. In fact, uh, Mara continues to, quote, visit the Buddha throughout his post-awakening life. After Siddhartha became the Buddha, right, Mara still periodically showed up, right? In fact, there's one episode that is literally a couple of weeks before his death. Um, so to say that we have as a goal destroying Mara is just inaccurate. Right? It sets a bar that even the Buddha didn't <laughs> meet, right? Um, so the back step a little bit for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mara, right? Mara uh, is thought of as a malignant celestial king. Um, he was also conceptualized sometimes as a kind of deity, right? Who tried to stop Siddhartha from attaining awakening, right? One of the earliest uh, appearances of Mara was when Siddhartha is thinking of renouncing um, his home life and um, Mara says, look, you know, if you stay here, you can become a king and do so much good in the world, right? Uh, rather than become a yogi. <laughs> right? uh, but that's one of the ways that Mara shows up. Right? And he, his whole goal is to try and keep the Siddhartha from awakening, from becoming a Buddha. Jnana Panika Tera, um, a Theravadan Buddhist monk, summarized Mara's role and character as, quote, the personification of the forces antagonistic to enlightenment. Um, which already points out that from the beginning, Mara was also seen psychologically, right? As I often describe him, he's that voice in our head that undermines our determination to practice, right? Often it's that voice that says, why bother? You'll never understand this stuff. It's too difficult, it's too hard, you give up too much fun and games and all that. But it also can appear as the voice that says, hey, you've practiced so diligently, you've been doing such a great job, you deserve a break. Hey, relax, chill out. Right? So it could appear as a, a kind of a, quote, friend, but with devious motivations. The word Mara comes from the Sanskrit form of the verbal root mur. Mara is a verbal noun, meaning causing death or killing. It's related to other words for death from the same root, such as marana and mrityu. The latter is a name for death personified, and in that sense is sometimes identified with yama. Right? The root mur is related to the Indo-European verbal root mur. M-E-R, which means die, in the context of death, murder, or destruction. And, you know, 
when we look at the family, the Indo-European family of languages, like French, uh, German, Dutch, English, we see the sound that comes out of this, right? Um, our word murder, murder is related to this Indo-European verbal root. Uh, in German, um, or rather in Old English, it was mortor, and the Dutch mord, and the German mord. Now my pronunciation might not be <laughs> completely accurate, but you, but you hear the similarities, right? So right from the beginning, as I said, Mara was understood as both having a literal existence, right, as well as being a, a psychological phenomenon. Mara is described both as an entity having real existence in the Kama world, the realm of desire. And he's also described in some places as the guardian of passion and the catalyst for lust, hesitation, and fear that obstructs meditation amongst Buddhist practitioners. The Denko Roku, a Japanese text, refers to Mara as one who delights in destruction. And in traditional Buddhism, in the earliest uh, Pali tradition, there are several metaphorical forms of Mara. First is Klesha Mara. Mara as Klesha Mara is the embodiment of all unskillful emotions, such as greed, hatred, and delusion, the three biggies, right, that are seen as the three roots or poisons of dukkha or suffering. And in that sense, it's perhaps the most relevant for contemporary practitioners, right? We're sitting in meditation and we start to feel aversion coming up, right? That's Mara. Then there's also Mrityu Mara, which is Mara as death. There's Skanda Mara. And here, Mara is a metaphor for the entirety of conditioned existence. Right? Skanda means aggregation, so all of conditioned existence. And then Mara as the deva of the sensuous realm, who was the Mara that tried to prevent Gautama Buddha from attaining liberation, is referred to as Deva Putra Mara. Right? Um, in the mythic story of the Buddha's awakening, it's a really cool, dramatic story, Mara first tries to thwart Siddhartha by sending in his army. Right? And, you know, they're shooting arrows at him, throwing spears and all that, and Siddhartha simply maintains his seat. Right? And the arrows, which are representing all forms of aversive emotion, anger, hatred, boredom, anxiety, fear, right? Common emotions, uh, experiences that meditators might experience in meditating, right? And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to just maintain in our seat, right? Like the Buddha did. And what happened is that the flowers fell, uh, the, the spears and the arrows fell as flowers at the feet of the Ramana Buddha. They didn't harm him. Seeing that the army failed, Mara then sends in his three daughters in an attempt to seduce Siddhartha from his determination to awaken by attempting to ensnare him with craving and lust. This is when we're in meditation and maybe we fall into one of the wonderful blissful samadhi states or the jhanic states. And, you know, they're wonderful, they're necessary, at least the first four, um, but uh, there's, a, there's a potential for grasping or clinging after them, right? And that's, that's you know, what's represented by his daughters here. Um, his daughters also fail to sway him. What does what is Siddhartha do? He just maintains his seat. So then finally... Mara taunts Siddhartha by attempting to make him doubt himself, asking him how he came to have the right to sit under the Bodhi tree, the tree of awakening. Who, he asked, is your witness? And I think it's interesting now, if, if you think of the five hindrances, um, we have craving, aversion, sloth and topor, we can think of that as dullness, laziness, boredom, all those things, agitation, anxiety, and then doubt. Right? The first four are represented by the army and Mara's daughters, 
But that fifth one, doubt, uh, is sometimes seen as the most pernicious, right? Um, when you see the traditional antidotes for all the others, there's a whole bunch of antidotes. When it comes to the one on doubt, that's the only one that really suggests maybe consulting with a teacher, someone who can give good guidance and advice. Right? If we give in to doubt, then our whole practice is destroyed. So in response to this taunt, right, Siddhartha replied, the earth is my witness. And the Buddha's response has been immortalized as the earth witness mudra. Right? That's the image that I'm putting up with this uh, podcast. It's also referred to as Bhumi Sparsha, where the Buddha is shown with his left hand in his lap and his palm facing upwards and his right hand resting on his right knee with the fingers of his right hand touching the earth. Right? And in the mythic story of his awakening, uh, the earth goddess herself arises as his witness. Right? And um, it's like almost like a character witness, you know, he's like, yes, he has every right to be here. And with that, Mara is defeated, but not destroyed. Right? He just turns away, powerless. Right? And as I said before, there are accounts that have Mara visiting the Buddha after his awakening, still trying to distract the Buddha from his mission, taunting him, for instance, when he experiences foot pain after an injury. Um, a few weeks before the Buddha's death, Mara shows up as a, quote, friend, you know, kind of friendful advice, suggesting that, look, you're old, you're ill, you're in physical pain, you've accomplished so much, and you have a Sangha filled with so many Arahants, like awakened beings who can carry on your legacy. Why don't you just let go? Shuffle off your mortal coil. The Buddha still had one more thing that he felt he needed to do before he could shuffle it off. And he just replies, I know you, Mara. Right. Now, the point I'm wishing to emphasize is we don't have to destroy Mara. Like the Buddha, what we need to do is awaken to Mara as Mara and thus change our relationship to Mara. This is the point made quite strongly and clearly by Stephen Batchelor in his book, Living with the Devil. Right? When that voice within taunts us, whether it's with craving, aversion, or self-doubt, if we can recognize it as Mara, Mara is defeated. Right? It's only in not seeing and recognizing Mara as Mara that we succumb and then Mara wins. From my own personal experience, I'd like to share how this can work because literally, uh, I sometimes with my students say, like, you know, when you're, when you're engaging with this, when you have like some kind of aversion to practice, right? Say, hello, Mara. Like, try to like approach it that way. Um, I was in uh, the Chicago temple and uh, we were renewing our precepts and it was hot. The windows were closed. It was in... July in Chicago. We had our robes on and we were doing 365 prostrations, right? A prostration for every day, right? And as we're going up and down doing the prostrations, I see out of my eye my teacher, Samu Sunim. He was doing them as well. And at the time, I guess I was close to 50. I knew he was in his 60s. And I was like, look at him showing off that he's still doing them, you know, because, you know, you would think I could have thought, wow, even the teacher's doing them. I'm, but no, I thought it was like, you know, I was just complaining, you know, and I was like, I'm, I'm how many are we going to be doing? Because we weren't told we were going to do 365. It's like, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm just all, all this mental turmoil. This is ridiculous. This is crazy. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. This, the hell with this, you know. And then all of a sudden, this little voice was like, hello, Mara. And I started laughing in the middle of a prostration. Uh, afterwards, one of the other monks like, came over and says, what were you laughing about? And I told him this story. I was like, it just became so clear how this Mara was working. 
<laughs> you know? And in recognizing, in recognizing that, the rest of the prostrations became re re effortless, right? I just went with it, you know, sweat going down and all that. But just, it was fine, right? It was until I recognized Mara, though, that I was caught. So all this as context, this is a mostly wonderful collection of essays about various aspects of Buddhist ethics. Part one looks at textual studies and their ethical applications. And in that section, I would say um, Charles Prebish's Mahayana Ethics in American Buddhism, Subtle Solutions or Creative Perversions, and Peter Harvey's Buddhist Perspectives on Crime and Punishment are the standouts. They're all good, but those two really, um, really are good, solid writing. Uh, in part two, Ethics and Social Engagement, Sally King's Elements of Engaged Buddhist Ethical Theory and Christopher Ives' In Search of Green Dharma, which examines Buddhist environmental ethics, are the standouts. They really shine. And they're very relevant, obviously, uh, ever more so every year, right, since this book came out. Part three is Ethics in a Global Context, and it looks at specific ethical issues in Theravada Buddhism, Chinese Pure Land Buddhism, and Thai Buddhism's contesting views, right? The different perspectives that um, are found, sometimes contradictory, as it says, contesting. Now, some of these essays are definitely more relevant to more specific subsets of readers. But most of them offer a more general readership, much to think about and ponder. As I said, I will be presenting a series of talks on Buddhist ethics and can affirm that this collection is a really good one to get a sense of the breadth of applications of Buddhist ethics. Other books I'll review are more specific in terms of ethics and various interpretations, as well as practices associated with ethics. Right? Sila, the five precepts, for instance. Um, sila is the first of what are called the three trainings. And the three trainings are the eight aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path broken up into these three trainings. And Sila is the first training, including right action, right speech, and right livelihood. So hopefully you'll be joining me in those. Thank you for joining me in this episode of Bups' Dharma Lounge. As we enter into 2024, I send my deepest wishes for healthy, happy, and as peaceful as possible New Year. There's so much in this world that is so beautiful, and too many of us don't seem to recognize that. We need more solidarity, love, compassion, wisdom.